Uh, we've been in a series called Dressed for the Occasion, and uh, before we jump into part 895 of that series, uh, I do want to, in case you weren't here when we first started, there's a, a youth Christmas party this Wednesday night, teenagers only. I mean, I know you're like, uh, it starts 6.30 to 8.30, and uh, so if you know any teenagers, invite them. If you've got teenagers, bring them. Go out on a date, mom, dad, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Welcome home. It's happening right after service today in the glass room right to your left on your way out. It's where we just uh, answer any questions you have about the dwelling, give you the vision and who we are, and uh, maybe some opportunities uh, for you to serve or get connected to a group or whatever that looks like here as you call this place home. Food pantry is happening this Saturday. Uh, if you want to serve, go to the dwellingchurch.org slash Food, were y'all listening at the beginning? Food, and sign up, say, I want to I wanna serve. Um, angel tree, get grab an angel, angel off the tree back there in the lobby when you leave so we can give uh, school uniforms to Otis Brock Elementary. Thank you, Chuck and Shay, Outreach, to all the people that are involved with the pantry and all that stuff. I'll just tell you this, 189 bags of groceries last month. And I just believe this month is going to be even bigger than that. How about we're not just doing dry goods. We got some meat in the freezer. And so that's going to be a big, a huge blessing to people. Love on our neighbors over here. And um, next week will be our last Sunday uh, of the year. Okay. I know, Leah, it's uh, sad. But so invite somebody. Um, there's going to be an emphasis on just the good news of the gospel next week. Um, I think that people are more open this time of year to their hearts are soft. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, you get in the line at the, at the fast food place and somebody's paying for your meal this time of year. I don't know why we do that this time of year, but it just happens. And people's consciences are, are open. Their hearts are open. And when they hear the good news of the gospel, I think people are just kind of more ready at Christmas for some reason. There's something powerful about the incarnation of Jesus and that he came and and so we're going to share that next week. And so invite somebody that needs to hear that. And then we will not have service on December 26th, okay? So are we having service on December 26th? No. no. Okay, you might, but it may be parking lot church. So, all right. Let's jump in. If you've got a Bible, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I'm in John 17. That's not a good, not a good start. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 3 through 10. All right, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says this. Teach these things, Timothy. Actually, this is verse 2. Teach these things, Timothy, and encourage everyone to obey them. Some people may contradict our teaching, but these are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Go easy on them, Paul. <laughs> Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble. I love that word. I'm going to use that this week. Quibble over the meaning of words. This stirs up arguments ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicions. You ever watch YouTube, Christianity on YouTube? That pretty much sums it up right there. <laughs> These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt, and they've turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. Verse 6, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Somebody say contentment. Contentment is what we're talking about today, right here at Christmas. <laughs> Bethany said, my wife, we were talking about this yesterday. I said, I'm going to talk about contentment. And she said, oh, great. Then we, go to, then we go finish our list, you know, after you're getting done talking about contentment. <laughs> Being clothed with contentment. The season that we're in, the storms that we're going through require certain attire, right? Yeah. We've talked about humility. We've talked about compassion. We've talked about just that identity of being beloved sons and daughters of the Father. And I talked about humility again because who needed it last week? This guy and I see you on another hand. So just us. All right. Um, but I want to talk about contentment today. 
Contentment obviously applies to our finances in this context, and we think about uh, material possessions. But how many know contentment is an overarching attitude or mindset that not only bleeds into our finances, but it bleeds into a lot of other areas of our life? And so contentment is a really important thing. And I, 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 before I kind of jump into contentment, or maybe at the same time I jump into contentment, I've got to talk about discontentment as well, okay, because they both go hand in, hand in hand, and I don't want us to get kind of mixed up on this. There is a godly discontentment and an ungodly discontentment. Ungodly discontentment leads me nowhere but bitterness and burnout. So it's never good enough and so I just keep striving to that, find that perfect salary or that perfect spouse or that perfect fill in the blank with anything. And I'm just seeking after something of this world that's just, it's temporary anyway. And so it'll never satisfy. And so I always, if I'm seeking, if I have an ungodly discontentment and I'm seeking to fulfill that, to become content because of something I'm adding to my life, I'm going to burn out in pursuit of that. And I'm going to get bitter in pursuit of that. But there is a godly discontentment that would lead me to the feet of Jesus. And when I get to the feet of Jesus, guess what I find? Contentment. And so there's a both and thing going on here. I think about the Old Testament. I think about Nehemiah. Nehemiah got word that the walls of Jerusalem were in disrepair. And he said, that ain't going to fly. Like, I, I can't sit here in luxury while my people are suffering. You know, there's this injustice happening. And Nehemiah says, I've got to go do something about it. It was a holy discontentment in his heart. Are y'all following me? When Jesus looked out among the crowds and it says he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And he says, too bad, I'm going to the house and cook me a steak. No, he's like moved with compassion. And it's a holy discontentment that is totally okay, necessary, essential, and godly. There are some things that ought to upset us. There are some things that ought to move us. There's some things that ought to bother us. So there's a holy discontentment. I want to just maybe give you an idea you haven't thought of today. Godly discontentment sometimes reveals what our calling is. Yeah. You ever thought about it that way? What is it that bothers you the most? Yeah. Maybe you're called to it. Ooh. Maybe you're called to bring the influence and the solutions of the kingdom of heaven into that situation. When you walk in at church and, and you say, man, I wish the dwelling had this, fill in the blank. Maybe you're called to that. Someone said, well, we got a prison minister here. I said, not yet, but are you interested? Like, it sounds like God's put that on your heart. Um, do we have a food pantry here? Yes. We need people to serve the food pantry. I, you know, I wish we had, this is, what I, this is what I wish. I wish we had an older kids in elementary class at the dwelling. Do you know that that currently doesn't exist, but it's going to? But guess what? We need to pull that off. If that's a need, it might be that the Lord's calling you to do that. Just, just question. Just throwing some, some questions out there, you know. Just what is, he, what is it that, that, that's just not quite right in the world that could reveal our assignment? And so, in one respect, you can be discontent and you can be content at the same time. And I want, I want to talk about this today. Choosing contentment. Everybody say choosing contentment. Contentment doesn't just fall out of the sky on my life. It's something I have to choose into. It's like joy. Some mornings I wake up and I'm full of joy and I don't know if I had a whole lot to do with it. Some days I'm not full of anything <laughs> and I have to choose joy. Well, the same thing with contentment. Contentment can be possible no matter what your bank account says. 
Have y'all seen these these TikToks or Instagram or whatever where where people are doing the audio of your bank account is twelve million, and then they like they're watching the person in the room and they go like, I want to do that on somebody, but I can't do it on you because you know you know about it. So <laughs> mess that one up. Choosing contentment. The first thing I want us to look at. Choosing contentment allows us to live in the present. It allows us to live in the present. Um, if we're not content, we're always going to be worried about the future. We're always going to worry about what we might not have enough of in the future. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. It's got enough trouble of its own. You remember that? So stay present, stay thankful. I want to clear something up. Contentment does not equate to laziness. So just because I'm content doesn't mean, oh, I'm content. I might as well just, you know, let life happen. That's not what contentment is. True contentment won't make you idle. True contentment will actually give you more fuel in your life than anything else because you realize finally where your source actually comes from. And suddenly there are no limits to what's possible. And that'll make you get up and move on it. I used to say there's no striving in the kingdom. That was my, there's no striving in the kingdom. I'm not sure that that's true. I just think there's different kinds of striving. I think there's striving in my flesh and in my power, and there's striving from rest. I think I can be at rest in Jesus and strive toward the prize. Isn't that what he said? He says, earnestly pursue spiritual gifts. Earnestly pursue peace with everyone. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Finish the race. There's no idleness about the Christian life. So so there is a contentment that can be had in the midst of pursuit. You follow me? So choosing contentment moves you forward. It allows me to live in the present, but also moves me forward. In other words, becoming content gives me intent. When I'm content, when I'm choosing contentment, it actually gives me, it actually stirs up my purpose. Now, this is what I want, this is what I mean by that. I can be content with who he made me to be, but intent on becoming who he died for me to be. We used to sing a song in the old hymnal. Where are my hymnal people at? We hold the hymnal. They used to call out the numbers. Y'all go walk in one day. They'll be like, what are these hymnals doing in here? <laughs> Satisfied with Jesus was, a, was one of those. And I remember thinking this as a, as a teenager. I'm satisfied with Jesus. Like he, ma- he gives me satisfaction, but I'm not satisfied in Jesus. Does that make sense? Like, like I'm satisfied with him. I'm totally content that he has come into my life and changed my life and he's made me right with God, but I'm not content with where I am in my relationship with him. All right, because there's always more. There's always more. And that hunger was always there. So be content with who he made you to be. Over the last couple years, it's been this pruning process. Uh, and how many know pruning is not fun? It's often painful in our life, but the result is just abundance of fruit. Over the last two years, what, one of the things that Jesus has been doing in my life is making me okay with me. And before you get upset and say, that's not scriptural and all that kind of stuff, listen, God made you how you are. But he died for you to become who he intends you to be. So what, we got, what we've got to do, and I saw this in a, in a video. I can't remember who said this. It might have been John Maxwell or something. I feel like I'm quoting him a, late, a lot lately. But he says, until you accept yourself, you can never change. Yes. And that's really true. Like for most of my religious life, I would have rejected that statement. But I'm just coming into the place in my life where I really like the man God made me to be. That's great. I really like it. And I'm just not going to pretend to be anything else anymore. In my pursuit of becoming like Jesus. Because that's who he made me to be. Like him. With gunner skin on. Like he's not going to. 
He's not going to like kill your personality, your likes, your interests. All this stuff is who you are. Just walk with Jesus and be you. Be you, fully you, full of him. A big lesson in my life over the last two years. But con that's contentment. That's what contentment practically looks like. I can be content with who he's made me to be. But I'm not satisfied because I know he's taking me somewhere. Can I get anybody feeling that one this morning? Okay. You can be content with what you have financially, but intent on stewarding it well. When we steward what he's given us, he can trust us with more. No, that's not the goal. How many of you have ever said, I wish I had more so I could fix that problem? I wish I could just buy her a car. You ever had that, you ever had that thought? Stewarding, it, stewarding what God has given us opens the door for us to do stuff like that. Being content with who he made you to be. I mean, being content with what you have, but intent on stewarding it well. Here's another one. Being content to stay, but willing to go. Somebody's, I'm talking to somebody this morning. Being content to stay, but being willing that when the call comes, and he says, it's time to move. You go. I'm going to talk to somebody else today. Being willing to go, but also willing to stay. That's what contentment looks like. I believe the greatest distraction of the enemy, he's got a lot of them, but they're all just distraction from our purpose and from our mission is having our mind fixed on the what, what ifs. I think what we can do, I feel like the Lord's on this this morning for some folks. I just feel it. What we can do is we can be so focused on one day when that we miss our now. We miss our present. Because you saying that today on December 12th, one day when and you miss the 12th, you miss the where God is at work all around you today. Well, guess what you're going to be saying tomorrow, one day when, and you're going to miss Monday and you're going to miss what God had when you were 38 thinking what's going to happen when you're 48 and you're going to miss what God had when you, when you're 48, because you're looking ahead. And I'm going to tell you, there's something about planning that the Lord honors. It's all in Proverbs. Like, don't, don't eat your seed corn, all that stuff. Like, like, do some planning, but don't miss the present. And the one thing that will keep us distracted from the present is discontentment. Boy, I wish I had. <laughs> Boy, one day when. And I'm missing the road that's right in front of me. I'm missing the people, the relationships that God, God's put right in my life. I'm missing the opportunities that he's put right in front of me because I'm worried about some day that hasn't happened and some perfect scenario that might not ever happen. I'm not shooting down and killing dreams this morning, but what I am saying, dreams are not the pursuit. Dreams come as a result of the pursuit of seeking his face. And when I seek his face, I love, I love this, my, my wife, back when we were in, I think it was in high school, and people were talking like, where are we supposed to go to college? What are we supposed to do after graduation? This applies to every season of your life, by the way. What am I supposed to do after this season of my life? How are we supposed to know these big decisions? And my wife said something so wise. I just remember sitting in a friend group, and she said, you know, if I'm following Jesus today, and I follow him tomorrow, and I'm just following him every day, then the day when the big decisions come, it's just like any other day. And I'm like, okay. Like, yeah, I did. <laughs> Contentment is that way. 
Contentment's not sitting on the sidelines. Contentment is fighting on the front lines because contentment is a weapon in the kingdom. I'll tell you something to drive the devil mad is for you just get satisfied in Jesus. Satisfied with what you have and what God's given you and thankful and grateful for what God's given you. And the joy just starts bubbling over and your life will change. Your life changes when you choose gratefulness, when you choose contentment. Are y'all following me this morning? Am I saying that don't have dreams, don't have aspirations, don't think about the future? I'm not saying that. I'm saying be content, which leads us to be intent. Pursuing all that God has for us, but being so satisfied in Him. Here's last, my last point. Jason, I need my, I need my stuff up here. Choosing contentment allows you to carry what, all, what God has already given you. So a lot of times we're worried about this, this season of our life where this assignment or this purpose of our life or whatever this on its way, it's, never, it's not here yet and all this stuff, and we, you know, we can miss that thing. I, I want to just propose this morning that God's already given us something to carry. And our job in this season of our lives is to just do a good job of stewarding well what he's already given us. Some might say amen while I open these oranges. I'm making some of y'all mighty hungry this morning. All right. What is this? This is the plate that was given to me. Jason didn't bring me a plate the size of Texas. Jason brought me this plate. God gives us a plate. Some people, some of you plates are bigger than some other people's plates in this room. That doesn't matter. It all serves a purpose. You might have a little plate. All that matters is it's your plate God's given you. There is a number of oranges that are meant to be on this plate. The size of this plate determines how many oranges fit on this plate. Now, this is about it. That's what that plate was meant to carry. You with me? Can I fit more on there? Yeah, I can. But that's, I mean, it's pretty sturdy, right? But I can, I can put more on here because I'm not content. I'm not content because I, I just need more. I just need more in my life. I need more of this. I need more of that. I need more money. So if I give up this opportunity, I might miss something really great. Uh-oh, wait, wait. Oh, Wait a minute. Okay, we're good. We're good. We're good. I can keep adding on, right? I can keep adding on. I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> See? <laughs> the plate was not designed to carry that, but it will until a storm comes. So maybe that's what I'm designed to carry. In our pursuit of comfort, riches, I mean, fill in the blank. We can overload ourselves with things that God never asked us to do. I love, um, I heard sometime, one time they were talking about Mary and Martha, and they said, you know, Mary knew what was important, and she sat at the feet of Jesus, but... Martha was making sandwiches Jesus never asked for. And sometimes we can, um, we can fill up our plate. We may think we can carry more than God has assigned us to carry. But when a storm comes, we won't be able to because storms shake things up. And being dressed for the occasion is having the wisdom and the understanding 
to carry what God has given you, nothing, le- nothing more, nothing less. Some storms are designed not to ruin us, but to reveal our capacity. Embrace the storm. Because how many, how many have ever needed your plate to be shaken off a little bit? This is what happened to all of us in 2020. Do you remember that? Do you remember 2020? Everything got shaken off, and what did we do? Oh, God, I got to get it. I got to get back up here. What am I doing? It's 2021. What are we doing? We got to get back. We got to get back. I've lost my oranges. You know, like we got to. <laughs> and I'm telling you, God's not an author of a storm. But when this happens, we get back to Come on. what we're called to, Great. what our assignment is. It's keeping our eyes fixed on what's important. So here's the question today. What are you carrying that he has not asked you to carry? What are you doing that he never asked you to do? And you say, well, I don't, I mean, how do I supposed to know that? Like I've got so many options. I've got so many oranges. Aren't you glad that? (laughs) I know, I was just trying to. (laughs) Didn't even finish the joke. It was going to be a good one, but I couldn't think. Jesus said this. Here's how you know it's real simple. It's a filter that you pull all, put all your oranges in, and then the ones that come out, you'll know. The ones that come out and survive on the other side, this is, this is what you keep. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek, seek first the kingdom of God. And if you need all this, it's going to come in time. But right now might not be the time to make it fit on your plate. 